The first of our requests this evening comes from the 13th chapter of Hebrews in verse 5. We're requesting that believers everywhere would be content with such things as they have. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. This is in recognition that our greatest possession, if you will, is the Lord himself. Yes. He is our exceeding and great reward. Amen. The things of this earth, uh, it, it's, it's a lesson that, that we all must learn because the things that we would own so easily own us. There's a, there's a sense in which uh, we're given the stewardship of them so that we're to be wise we're to give attention to it. We're, God doesn't say just throw your hands up in the air and live like a sparrow. Gather whatever seeds and berries you can find, and and don't take you don't just take no care for the things that I've put in your hand. We're to show forth His likeness in the way that we handle the things that that we're given uh, use of or owner. You know, at least temporary ownership of, stewardship of, we would say, because we know that in the end, we're going to hand it all back to him and give an account for how it was handled. So we, we must not lose sight that it is the master's world, and these are his goods, and we are his people. And we're, this is a way, you remember when in the beginning, uh, he told Adam and Eve, have dominion. He put all things under their hand. He gave them dominion over the things he had made. Well, this is in a lesser sense. We're, we're living in a fallen condition from one perspective. But this new creature in us is still receiving that injunction from the Lord. And the things that that he has put in our hand, we are to exercise dominion over mm -hmm. and to do it in a way that he can be recognized in it. Amen. So that's, that's part of the import of that. The other is that we are being tested by this world and the possessions that come to our hand. It will, will you love him more? Because they very easily... and. These things are not just houses and lands that we're talking about. We're talking about everything he puts in our hand. We're talking about our children. We're talking about if you have livestock. We're talking about everything. Your influence God has given you. But possessions, physical things in particular. To, have, to be content with such things is to recognize like the servant that was given one talent, that this is what God has said you can handle. Yeah. And the servant that was given five, to recognize this is what God has enabled you to have, be able to give a good account of. Yeah. So as not to be greedy for this world and to extend ourselves into areas that we really aren't equipped to operate and to not get our eyes fixed on the things of this earth as though they weren't going to perish. See, that, yeah. that puts the lie to our profession also. We are pilgrims passing through. Uh -huh. So what does that say about, I mean, it's, a, it's actually a, a good indicator to our own faith. Do we really believe that we're just passing through? Uh -huh. Do we yeah. really believe that these world's goods are going, either they're going to be taken from us or else we're going to leave them behind? Do we really believe this? Do we believe that it is God with whom we have to do? So putting, setting our affection on anything lower than God yes. is a form of idolatry. Covetousness, John says, is, which is idolatry. So we want, to, we want to glorify God by being content, and that contentment will also prepare us to be better stewards. Because we will we'll be more diligent if we know that we're dealing with God's things instead of ours. 
we'll actually do a better job of, of asking him for wisdom and guidance and ability and strength and not see them as things just given to us for our own disposing according to our own lusts and pleasures, but that they are actually to be used, subjugated, if you will, sanctified, if you will, to the Savior's use. Who will lead us in that request? Brother Jeremy. All right, Sister Laura, Brother Tony, and Brother Levi. Amen. Next, we're going to uh, turn back to Hebrews chapter 4. This time, asking that all believers would come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace. Verse 16. Let us, therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Of course, this is predicated upon the knowledge of our great high priest. What, what manner of high priest? So that we don't need to be, uh, we don't need to draw back in dread of God as though we won't be received or that he is not pleased with, with our coming because of Jesus. We, whenever we, you cannot pray this prayer and not be mindful of Jesus in the capacity of high priest. You just can't do it. You have no basis to draw near to the throne of grace. You have no access to the throne of grace, except that we have a high priest that is ever standing in the presence of the Father to make intercession for us, and who presents, if you will, his own blood as a covering for us so that the wrath of God is hidden from us. The sin is taken away. So that's why we have boldness. It's a, it's a confidence born of knowledge of the good pleasure and will of God and the perfection of the work of our high priest that, that would draw us to even desire this and to know that we can do it. Otherwise, we would draw back unto perdition. So we're asking that all believers... All believers would come boldly, confidently, expectantly, reverently, with godly fear. And yet this boldness is, is comprehended in these things to the throne, not to the throne of power, although you can't come to God and not, not be coming into his power too, but to the throne of grace. The things that, that we would come, this mercy that we would obtain, and it, this grace that we would find is God answering by his power in a manner that would not destroy, but rather that would conform us and cause us to overcome in ways that would please him and give glory to him, that would that would not leave us with defilement on us, but rather with purity and, and so that in, in finding the mercy and finding the grace, we would also find ourselves closer to the Lord at the end of whatever it is that we need help with. So will it be manifesting God's wisdom in these things also? Who will lead us in that request? For all believers, all of us that are still traversing in this earth. Sister Laura, Brother Jean, Sister Melissa. And then finally, brethren, if you'd like to turn back to Psalm 37, verse 1. Our prayer is that we would not fret or be upset or agitated because of evildoers. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. And then he goes on to say what their end is. It's easy to get fretted, if you will, or fretful about evildoers because sometimes it appears as though they have the upper hand. Sometimes uh, they're in a position to, to do us hurt. Sometimes uh, it looks like, like they're overcoming instead of us. But evil 
evil will be overcome of good. It is the greater force because God is good. When you seek goodness, you're seeing the evidence of God's presence and work. Goodness doesn't happen outside of God. It doesn't happen apart from God. And he, this whole thing, see, we, we, even if we looked over our entire lifetime, from the time we were, we were born to the time we, we lay down in the grave, it is such a minuscule part of the entire purpose of God as it concerns the human race. Adam lived 930 years. Jared lived uh, 962 years. Methuselah lived 969 years. And yet, except for whenever we were mindful of certain things, they don't come into remembrance a lot. I don't get up every day and think of any of the three of them, particularly, you know, intentionally. Yet, as, as men count time, they occupied a larger chunk of human history than anybody we know. We don't even approximate it. So it's not man that is the issue. The only reason we have a remembrance of them is because God. There were, there were millions and millions of people that have lived and died in obscurity. Nobody, nobody even remembers that they ever existed. So whenever we're asking of this, we've got to remember that the evildoers are going to fall in that category. The obscure, the forgotten, the insignificant. But because God has a purpose and because God is working, we don't need to fret ourselves because God is, he works, he's toward us. I mean, there have been times whenever God purposed something and because the righteous cried to him for mercy, he extended mercy that would not otherwise have been given. So there is that hope that God does hear us in our present distresses. But more than that, just like the Hebrew, this is the same spirit that the Hebrew young men, we call them the Hebrew children, but they were young men, when they answered Nebuchadnezzar, now, Nebuchadnezzar could fret a person. He had power. But they didn't fret themselves because of what he was doing. Instead, their reply was, we are not careful to answer thee, O king, for the Lord will deliver us. Whether he delivers us out of the fire or not, he will deliver us. We'll be delivered from your hand. So, Whatever the evildoers are, whoever they are, whatever position that, that they possess at the time, they will be overcome of God. And so to, for the believer to look steadfastly, not to get our, our gaze fixed on what the evildoers are doing, but rather to be fixed on what God is doing and what God is able to do. So who'll lead us in that request? that believers would not be, not fret themselves because of evildoers. Sister Barb. Sister Laura. All right, brethren. Brother Judah, we'll ask you.